Concord Baptist Church in the hour of depression. So good to have you here this morning. Amen. Because <laughs> people that are religious and lost, they are depressed if they're sitting in services. They're just doing it for a fire escape. Amen. Yeah, they just they just looking for that iron ladder hanging on the side of a brick building. Amen. It's not that they want to go to heaven, they don't want to go to hell, but they don't want to get in line. Amen. But uh good to have Brother Parson, Miss Parson here this morning. Uh pray for Brother Steve. He's in a lot of pain because he can't take any of his arthritis stuff, nothing, not even an aspirin. So he can get his knee surgery done. And so that just crippled him up real bad. So pray for him. And uh, let's see. Petra is on her way. She won't get here till 11, she said. And anything else? Jimmy James. I don't know where James is. My, my friend uh, Wayne Walker did get out of the hospital with the COVID in his, his home and apparently doing okay. Uh, the Collins family is still quarantining. They will be for another week and a half. That's three little children and wife and him. There he is. Brother yeah. Brother Raj, I think you said he had what, five more days in quarantine over there. And he asked me if I bring him food, could I bring it in smaller containers because it won't fit in his fridge. <laughs> Amen. So... Anyway, we did a 21-pound chuck roast, so that ought to be plenty. Mm. Oh, so hey, baby. I I huh? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> but uh, I smelled it all night. I put it on low, let it cook and cook down. But uh. I'm pretty sure your whole house probably smelled like the chuck roast the whole night, didn't it, Pastor? Yeah, yes, it did, did Derek. And when sure you dream of it, though. Ah, yeah, you did. You heard that from Mrs. Trump back there. <laughs> <laughs> she got that white shirt on, that big, long, red tie, man. She's a Trumper. This is the blonde hair going up crazy. <laughs> hey, man. All right, Brother Dave, if you'd be so kind as to pray for us. Pray for my brother. He had a temperature 102 and congestion on his chest, and he went and took the COVID test yesterday, but they won't know for 72 hours. There's, there's a quickie test. There, I don't know why I wouldn't give yeah, you a quickie test. test. It, 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 oh, it only good. takes oh. uh, about 10 minutes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he. I knew he was sick when he called up and said he wasn't going to make it to the Gun and Knife show. Yeah. You know, pray for my friend Kenny. Kenny? He's still in the hospital? Yes, and they thought that, and he's still sedated, and they thought that he was stabilized enough to take him for an MRI before they started the surgery procedures they need to do to put him back together. And on his way down there, he had two heart attacks. Wow. And now he's, obviously they didn't, they didn't get that, but he's got a blockage in his liver. There. How do you get a blockage in your liver? I don't know. But I don't know. Something's got to flow through it to purify the blood. Yeah. The nurse said he's he's worse than horrible. That's what her words were to his mother. Mm. I just have Richland at all. No, mm. no visitor. Uh -uh. Continue to pray for uh, Danny Mallory too. How did you beat Russ here? Is what I want to know. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Brother Dave, if you would. Lord oh God, we do thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your love, Lord God. And show us all the time, Lord. And Father, we do thank you for the Parsons being here, Lord. And, and thank you for giving them traveling mercies and getting them here safe and whole, Lord. And Father, we're looking to hear from, uh, from the Word of God from uh, Brother Parsons at the uh, preaching hour, Lord. And Father, uh, we, you heard all the prayer requests for, for uh, all the different people, Lord, and illnesses and afflictions, Lord. And, Father, we do pray, Lord, that uh, you put your healing hand on them and, and help them, lift them up, Lord. And Father, get them healed up and get them back home or, or whatever. And their, their families, Lord, give them much grace to go through the illnesses with them, Lord, for they're all part of it. And Lord God, uh, we're looking to hear from you, Lord God, today from the 
from the Sunday school and the preaching hour, Lord, that uh, you know, you'll be in it, Lord, that uh, you have the people uh, read up, studied up, prayed up. That's going to present what we're going to hear today, Lord God. And, uh, look, Lord, and I do pray, Lord God, that you'll be in it, that you'll walk the aisles amongst us, Lord, that uh, you'll be glorified and exalted. Uh, for uh, you are deserving, Lord God. And we'll thank you and praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. name we pray. Amen. Amen. I tell you, the way this council culture's going, something's going to break loose, whether it's Trump or the people. But, you know, Hawley had that thing lined up in Orlando for a fundraiser in February. And because some lawyer down there knew he, he was standing with Trump, they started the thing and had it. Then the hotel canceled it. And uh, did these... Uh, turncoat Republicans, do they really believe that the Democrats are going to trust them? If you'll turn on your own, you'll turn again. Amen. They're, they're just opportunists. They're not turncoats. They were communists to start with. They just didn't cover it. Up. Yeah, they, pro they turned to when they were with Trump. But you remember how liberal Lindsey Graham was before Trump? Amen. <laughs> so, got a we're having a rough time. We're going to, might be even rougher in this country, but uh, thank God he's coming soon. Amen. Amen. Yeah. We're from another country. Amen. You know, America is, is, is what's uh, changed the whole world. God used, has used America greatly to change the world. And communists would have already taken over had not been for all the Americans that died to fight against it. Yeah. And you you look now, buddy, we, we, we're we set up for the one world government because the communists we've got in there right now, they're going to they're gonna turn it over to the one world government. Well, they said that America would never be taken from without but within. And it's in, and they knew that, and they started years and years ago while we were sitting on our duffs. They started in the grade schools and breaking down the family and the immorality. I mean, you look at the ten planks of communism, and you see how they went right through it while we sat by and did nothing. I was saying the other day when we were going to the streets in the early 90s fighting against sodomy and all that, couldn't get none of the other churches to join in. If we'd have stemmed a little bit of it back then, we probably wouldn't be so bad today. Amen. But anyway, I remember one of them spitting on my mom. <laughs> my mom was out there even. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> now they took off. But uh, anyway, just thank God we got the word of God and we know what the future holds. We've already won. They just don't know it. Amen. Amen. Anyway, we started Thursday evening. I didn't realize how many people sitting in church do not realize that they are part of a priesthood. Yeah. And what your responsibilities are in that priesthood. Amen. No wonder the churches are so dead. And I didn't realize how many people were like that. And so we started Thursday night on the priesthood. Mm -hmm. Why the devil hates it so much. Because he was in that priesthood. You find him over in Ezekiel chapter 28 with the breastplate on. Amen. With all the stones. And he fell. And he hates that priesthood. He hates you being in it and operating in it. Amen. And so I did that again Friday night. I started showing people that Melchizedek is the Holy Ghost. Amen. You have some of these bonehead teachers today tell you that it's Jesus. Or he had no beginning of days, no end of life. They meant he had no pedigree. Amen. Wicked. But uh, Melchizedek, being the Holy Ghost, he's called King of Salem. But it's just, which is by interpretation, King of Peace. He's King of, well, who's the Prince of Peace? Well, can Jesus be the Holy Ghost then? Can he be Melchizedek? No. King of Salem. Now think of. Jerusalem, he was there, showed up the first mention in uh, Genesis 14 when Abraham was giving him tithes, amen. And 
Jesus Christ was made a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, Psalm 110. Amen. And then it tells us in Hebrews, it says, consider how great this man was. He said he was made like unto the son of man. What do you mean? He had a body. So the Holy Ghost in a body is Melchizedek. He's God's eternal high priest. He's the one that took the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ before the altar in heaven. Amen. And you were made part of that priesthood. For he hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. We got a royal priesthood, kingly priesthood, and we've been made part of that. And just as the Old Testament priest in Leviticus offered up physical sacrifices, we're to offer up spiritual sacrifices like our body and thanksgiving and offerings and and uh, all these are seven of them. Amen. And we're supposed to practice that priesthood every day. We're sons, we're soldiers, and we're kings and priests. Remember what he said over in the Gospels, occupy till I come? That's a military term. We're supposed to be occupying. We're not supposed to be occupants. We're supposed to be occupying. <laughs> Amen. So how many of us have let the Lord down? Well, you can't practice a priesthood you know nothing about. Amen. Amen. All right. Evangelist Tim Wheat, come lead us in the music. <laughs> yes, well, good morning, Concord Baptist Church, and if you please would stand, stand and turn to page 17, Come Thou Found. Baptist Church, and for those of you on the internet, that would be ConcordIndependentBaptistChurch.com, and those on Facebook, or Facebook, it's <laughs> Frank Townsend, T-O-W-N-S-E-N-D, a uh, quick reminder from Brother Tommy back there, uh, look sharp here, I'd like to welcome everybody, it is a, truly an honor and a pleasure to be here before you this morning, we'll be continuing here in the Trail of Blood by J.M. Carroll that uh, 
uh, reading that I I ask that each and every one of us read. It is a part of being a Baptist, and it helps you to understand where you're going when you know where you came from. And all of the sacrifices, toils, uh, martyrs that are in our past, uh, it will ease your mind a little bit to know that we're not the first ones to go through trials and tribulations like we may be going through here very shortly. Uh, let's open up here quick with a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again, Lord, for all the blessings you've bestowed upon us, for everything that we we have that we take for granted, Lord, like freedom and the ability to move about and say what we wish. Uh, Lord, we give thanks for each and everything that we have on loan from you. And Lord, we ask that you look down upon my prayer list this morning. We've already gone over it and we've had a few additions here that if it be your will that you put your healing hand upon them and, and get them back up to speed. And for those that are out and are missing this morning, we hope that you will um, get them back in here as soon as possible. And Lord, I also uh, give thanks this morning for sending your son to be our Lord and Savior. And uh, Lord, I ask also that you give me the verbal clarity this morning to convey a message which is both meaningful and insightful. And these things I ask in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, this week will be a monumentous week here as uh, uh, God may pass judgment upon us as a nation. And if he does, uh, we, uh, we've covered a lot of what the martyrs went through. I don't think we will be in that predicament, but if we should, if you have not asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, it is now time. And uh, because if he doesn't, and if he spares us and gives us a reprieve, then we, we can reap back or and apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah because it's, uh, it's, been a wicked world that we live in and uh, we Amen. have not done enough yes, you're right. to to try to change it and uh, for this we may be held accountable uh, we're going to turn now and once again here anyone who doesn't have this book uh, I've got one of my customers that I am going to get a hold of one and put it on in the mail to him in snail mail he is, uh, she has requested it, and uh, I will be happy to send it to her. And anybody else out there, if you will contact us, we will make sure that you get a copy of this. It is, uh, it, it actually is like cliff notes and will open up, hopefully, you to a whole wonderful world of where we came from as Baptists. Uh, we're on page 46. But first, I would like to back up. We went over this last week, and it was John and Charles Wesley, and George Whitefield was mentioned, and we covered John and Charles Wesley, and uh, Johnny Odom, if you're listening out there this morning, I told you Charles Whitefield, it is George Whitefield. And I got him confi uh, confused with the two Wesley brothers. And this is a little bit about him. Uh, as far as a timeline goes, let's, uh, let's go back over to where we were on page 46. And it says, Though the Spanish and others of the Latin races, the Catholics, as religionists, came to be the first representatives of the Christian religion in South and Central America. But in North America, uh, except in Mexico, they have never strongly predominated. predominated. Uh, in the territory of what is now the United States, except in those sections which were once part of Mexico, there have never been, they have never been strong enough, even in the colonial period, to have their religious views established by law. Beginning with the colonial period, in the early part of the 17th century, the first settlements were established in Virginia, 
a little later in a territory known now, known as the New England states, religious and more properly speaking, uh, irreligious persecutions in England and on the continent, continent were at least among the prime causes which led to the first settlements of the United States colonies. Uh, in some of the groups of immigrants in which first came, not including the Jamestown group of 1607 and those known as the Pilgrims in 1620, were two groups, one at least called the Puritans. These were Congregationalists. Governor Endicott was, a, was uh, in control of their colony. The other group, were Presbyterians. Among these two groups, however, were a number of Christians that were of other views than theirs, also seeking relief from persecution. Uh, as a timeline, in 1675, uh, we Christians can have, we had Spencer's Pia Descendria, uh, advances in pietism uh, and i think back to the three stooges power square and power round but uh that is not what we're talking about here in 18 1682 william penn founded pennsylvania in 1607 isaac watts published hymns and spiritual songs in 1714 was born george whitefield and he was born in Gloucestershire, England. Uh, as a boy, he read plays insatiably and often skipped school to practice his schoolboy performances. Later in life, he repudiated the theater. And that we can all appreciate because even back in his time, the actors and actresses were not good role models. And uh, he put some air between himself and them. Uh, he experienced, wait a minute, whoa, 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 let me back up. Later in life, uh, the, the, he repudiated, but the methods he embedded as a young man emerged in his preaching. And I find this, this, this preacher, this evangelist as being one that was really special. I'd never heard of him until I started reading this. I'd never heard of Whitefield. Uh, no one had ever brought it up, or unless you had at some point. Uh, but uh, the, the, he, he preached as many as 18,000 times, 18,000 sermons that he delivered in his life. I find that remarkable, and uh, I don't know how we even figured it out. He had to do a couple of day in some places. Uh, and maybe as, mi as many as 10 million listeners combined. Mm -hmm. So this guy was really reaching out and sharing the gospel with uh, everybody from England to Scotland, back to America, the colonies over here. He went to the penal colony, otherwise known as Georgia. He actually started a, a orphanage down there. Uh, so he put himself through Pembroke College, Oxford, uh, by waiting on wealthier students. While there, uh, he fell in with a group of, uh, of pious Methodists who called themselves the Holy Club, led by the Holy Brothers, John and Charles Wesley, which reverts back to what we were talking about last week with the Wesley Brothers. Under their influence, he experienced a new birth and decided to become a missionary to the new Georgia colony on the other side of the Atlantic. And then, like I say, back to the AKA Georgia, the penal colony. Uh, it still is a penal colony today, I believe. Uh, when the voyage was delayed, Whitefield was ordained a deacon in the Anglican church and began preaching around London. He was surprised to discover that whenever he spoke, crowds materialized and uh, hung on to every word. These were no ordinary serm sermons. He portrayed the lives of biblical characters. And once again, his theatrical experiences uh, led him to, I guess, 
embed that into his his preaching, which made it a whole lot more interesting than me. But uh, uh, he cried, he danced, he screamed. Among the enthralled was one David Garrick, then the most famous actor in Britain. He uh, said, I would give a hundred guineas he, uh, if I could say, oh, like Mr. Whitefield. Once when preaching on eternity, he suddenly, <laughs> he suddenly stopped his message, looked around and exclaimed, and I, I practiced this a little bit, but I couldn't get it down pat, so I'm going to read it. It said, hark, methinks I hear the saints chanting their everlasting hallelujahs and singing an eternal day and echoing for triumphant songs of joy. <laughs> and uh, do you not long, my brethren, to join this heavenly choir? Uh, Whitefield eventually made it to Georgia, but stayed there only three months. He returned to London and found many churches had closed their doors to this guy, and mainly because of his unconventional way of preaching. Uh, you, and you got to remember, back in those days, especially like Puritans and the guys that's on the oatmeal can, uh, Quakers, they all, it was sit in your pew, and if you fall asleep like James does sometime, <laughs> they had actually a long pole on a fulcrum and they could swing it around the audience and bip you on the head <laughs> if you fell asleep. And in this case here, we just <laughs> ring the bell. So Whitefield, uh, I see, while he was in Georgia, he did establish a uh, orphanage down there and I've been unable to ascertain what the name of it was and if it still exists. But he also invested much of the monies that he received from his preachings in this orphanage and pretty much lived a very, very meager life because all of his money went to this orphanage over in the penal colony of Georgia. Uh, it said, uh, he's, Whiteville set out preaching uh, a tour in the American colonies. Whiteville selected uh, the most cosmopolitan cities of the New World, uh, as the first American on his first American stop, but even the largest churches could not hold the 8,000 who would sometimes show up to see or hear him speak. Uh, Every uh, one of Whitefield's trip was marked by record audiences, often exceeding the population of the town where he was preaching. Whitefield was often surprised at how large the crowds was, so scattered about, and uh, could be, he told, he gave them warnings to keep calm, because quite often for getting a better position, there was actually pushing and shoving that would cause uh you know, some people to fall down and get trampled on, uh, which almost like a rock star or something. The uh, the crowds were also aggressive in spirit. As one account tells it, crowds elbows shoved and trampled all over themselves to hear the divine things from the famed Whitefield. He had a, an ability to enunciate and oritate to the crowd that very few preachers have ever been able to master before or since. Uh, once Whitefield started speaking, however, the frenzy mobs were spellbound. Even in London, Whitefield remarked, I never observed so, proud, so profound a silence. Uh, though mentioned by the Wesleys, Whitefield set his own theological course. He was con a convinced Calvinist his main theme was the necessity of new birth, by which he meant a conversion experience. Uh, he, was, he never pleaded with people to convert, but only announced that and uh, dramatized this in his voice. And then basically the message that he spoke 
was in, in imploring people to get down on their knees and ask for salvation. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, uh, the famous Jonathan Edwards, another great evangelist, wife, Sarah, remarked, he makes less of the doctrine, doctrines than our American preachers generally do and aims more at affecting the heart. He was a born orator, a uh, prejudiced person. Uh, I know might say that this was all theatrical uh, artifice and display, but not so will anyone think who has seen or heard him when he gave a sermon. Whitefell also made, made an effort to preach to the slaves of the time and would go out of his way to preach to them. Uh, there is some in the, the black, I guess you would say churches that actually believe that he was basically the father of black evangelist Christianity in probably the world. And I'm sure there were some, some missionaries that went to Africa, but here in the new world, uh, they really made an effort to put uh, some of the slaves I know here in the south up in the balconies and some of them even had their own churches and which usually had a white pastor uh, but Whitefield uh, did not approve of slavery don't get me wrong there he uh, he was adamantly against to it against it uh, a, the spiritual revival he ignited uh, was like the great awakening became one of the most uh, torment of events in history. His last sermon on tour was given at the Boston Commons before 23,000 people. And that had to have been in the mid 1700s. And at that time, it was recorded as the largest gathering of Americans at one time in the, in the country's history. So we have a deep embedded history of, of Christianity in this country, and we have fallen off tremendously. And like I say, we may pay the price for it here shortly. Uh, Whitefield next set his sights on Scotland to which he would make 14 visits in his life. Uh, his most, uh, his most visits to one area, actually. When he visited the small town of Crambushling, uh, which was already in a revival, his evening, his evening service attracted thousands and continued to 2 a.m. in the morning, which was really late for those folks back then. There were scenes of uncontrollable distress, like a field of battle. All night in the fields might be heard the voices of prayer and praise. And I think that is a great thing myself to hear people praising and praising the Lord and getting down and praying, which is what we need to do. And uh, he said it far outdid all that he ever saw over here in America. On uh, one Saturday, Whitefield in concert with area pastors preached to an estimated 20,000 people and services that stretched well into the night. The following morning, more than 1,700 uh, folks streamed along uh, common tables to set up tents. Everywhere in the town, he called, you might have heard these persons praying to the and praising God. Well, the, this was a true evangelist. It, at this time, to get crowds to come together, most of them had to travel and walk and get on buggies and carts. They didn't hop in the car. They didn't have heat. They couldn't turn on the windshield wiper to get the frost off. They had to bundle up, hook up the horse, or get on the horse, or either hoof it with Pat and Charlie there. Uh, he was a cultural hero. With every trip across the Atlantic, he became more and more popular. Indeed, much of the early controversy that surrounded Whitefield's revivals disappeared. Critics complained 
of the excess enthusiasm of both preacher and crowds. And I once again think that is a good thing. And uh, former foes warmed to a uh, mellowed white field. Before his tours in the colonies were complete, virtually every man, woman, and child had heard the grand alliterate uh, at least once. So pervasive was Whitefield's impact in America that he came justly, he can justly be styled America's first cultural hero. Uh, indeed, before Whitefield, it is doubtful any name other than royalty was known equally from Boston to Charleston. Whitefield's long, lifelong successes in the pulpit were not matched in his private life, and we're not going to go into all that. He, he uh, never really had too good a relationship with his wife, it, uh, probably because he was on the road all the time, and, and that can cause an issue, as we all know. And uh, being out and away from home, leaves wife home to do everything, usually by herself. Uh, in his last, uh, before he died, his last sermon, uh, one listener recounted, recounted for the press that he cried out in a tone, a tone of thunder, works, works, a man gets to heaven by works. I would think of climbing to the moon on a rope of sand first. And he, of course, Im was implying here, good works. You can do all of the good works you want to do and need to do as a Christian. But if you're not washing the blood of Jesus Christ, it's all for naught. Right. Uh, and then that morning, he passed away the next morning and uh, thus... Uh, one of the greatest evangelists that we have been blessed to study here in my Sunday school class. Uh, Preach, you want me to continue on or? Yeah, we'll cut it off. Okay, all right. We're going to pick up on page 46 next week. I would like to thank Christian History and Christian History Today for the material that I got on uh, George Whitefield. And uh, remember... Preach Jesus and everything you do, and if you have to, use words. Thank you. The model from our man. <laughs> Amen. I didn't quite understand where we are talking about Whitfield. Is it is it spelled Whitfield or Whitefield? It's Whitefield. It's Whitefield. Did I say Whitfield? It's spelled Whitfield. Both ways. Yeah. It's spelled both ways. Yeah, he, they actually used it both ways. It was, yeah, I always uh, referred to him as Whitfield. Yeah, but, I, uh, the county I live in was named after him. Whitefield. Whitfield. 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 Don't be offended by my calling George of the penal colony. <laughs> 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 he was one of 11 kids and... Who was it? I thought he was one of the. Who was it that had 23 kids? She married. Him. That was Sus Suzanne Wesley, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. 24 children, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cold winters there. Cold winters. And uh, no TV, so. Amen. <laughs> but uh, when you mentioned Calvinism, I, I, I don't think he believed in. The Calvinism that they're preaching today, Amen. Uh, your, your predestination. Yeah, uh, irresistible grace, and you know we do believe in the total depravity of man. I believed that even before I met you, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, we appreciate. I like the apology to the Sodom and Gomorrah folks. Yeah. <laughs> If God doesn't judge this place, we ought to apologize to him. Amen. But I wanted to read something to you while we got a few minutes. If you've got a King James Bible in the front of the Bible, it's got to the most high and mighty Prince James by the grace of God. Uh, it's an epistle dedicatory. And I just wanted to read the first section. But if you've never read the translators to the reader, you need to read that 
Amen. But it says, uh, by the grace of God, King of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith. The translators of the Bible wish grace, mercy, and peace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Great and manifold were the blessings, most dread sovereign, which Almighty God, the Father of all mercies, bestowed upon us, the people of England, when first he sent your majesty's royal person to rule and reign over us. For whereas it was the expectation of many who wished not well unto our Zion, that upon the setting of that bright occidental star, Queen Elizabeth, of most happy memory, some thick and palpable clouds of darkness would so have overshadowed this land, that men should have been in doubt which way they were to walk, and that it should hardly be known who was to direct the unsettled state. The appearance of your majesty as the sun, S-U-N, in his strength, inst instantly dispelled those supposed and surmised mists and gave unto all that were well affected exceeding cause of comfort. Especially when we beheld the government established in your highness and your hopeful seed by an undoubted title, and this also accompanied with peace and tranquility at home and abroad. But among all our joys, there was no one that more filled our hearts than the blessed continuance of the preaching of God's sacred word among us, which is that inestimable treasure, which excelleth all the riches of the earth, because the fruit thereof extended itself not only to the time spent in this transitory world, but directeth and disposes men unto the eternal happiness, which is above in heaven then not to suffer this to fall to the ground, but rather take it up and to continue it in that state wherein the famous predecessor of your highness did leave it. Nay, to go forward with the confidence and resolution of a man in maintaining the truth of Christ and propagating it far and near is that which has so bound and firmly knit the hearts of all your majesty's loyal and religious people unto you, that your very name is precious among them. Their eye doth behold you, with comfort and they bless you in their hearts as that sanctified person who under God is the immediate author of their true happiness. And this, their contentment does not diminish or decay, but every day increases and take its strength when they observe that the zeal of your majesty toward the house of God does not slack or go backward, but is more and more kindled manifesting itself abroad in the farther, farthest parts of Christendom by writing in defense of the truth, which hath given such a blow unto the man of sin, as will not be healed. And every day at home, by religious and learned discourse, by frequenting the house of God, by hearing the word preached, by cherishing the teachers thereof, by caring for the church as a most tender and loving nursing father. There are infinite arguments of this right Christian and religious affection in your majesty, but none is more forcible to declare it to others than the vehement and perpetrated desire of accomplishing and publishing of this work, which now with all humility we present unto your majesty. For when your highness had once out of deep judgment apprehended how convenient it was that out of the original sacred tongues, together with comparing of the labors both in our own and other foreign languages of many worthy men who went before us, there should be one more exact translation of the Holy Scriptures into the English tongue. Your majesty did never desist to urge and to excite those to whom it was commended that the work might be hastened and that the business might be expedited in so decent a manner as a matter of such importance might justly require. And now at last, by the mercy of God and the continuance of our labors, our labors, it being brought unto such a conclusion as that we have great hopes that the Church of England shall reap good fruit thereby. We hold it our duty to offer it to your majesty, not only as to our king and sovereign, but as to the principal mover and author of the work, humbly craving your most sacred majesty that since things of this quality have ever been subject to the censures of ill-meaning and discontented persons, it may receive approbation and patronage from so learned and judicious a prince as your highness is, 
whose allowance and acceptance of our labors shall more honor and encourage us than all the calumnations and hard interpretations of other men shall do dismay us so that if on the one side we are traduced by popish persons amen at home or abroad who therefore will malign us because we are poor instruments to make god's holy truth to be yet more and more known unto the people whom they desire still to keep in ignorance and darkness and do you realize that they're the daughters of the whore are still doing that today you know how they do it? If you don't understand what the originals say, you, you don't have a good understanding. In the original, it says, and not one of them have an original. Amen. They go to four years of Bible college and some fellow up there tries to teach them some Hebrew and, and Greek. And then they come out and they want to sound really educated. And they go to the back of the Strong's Concordance to the Hebrew and Greek Dictionary. They look up the number beside the word that they read, and then they try to tell you what it says in Hebrew and Greek. Amen. You know what that means? That means you can't understand this unless you go to their pope. They become the pope. You can't understand your Bible unless you have them expounded to you in the Hebrew and the Greek. How crazy is that? Or if on the other side we shall be maligned by self-conceited brethren who run their own ways and give liking unto nothing but that but what is framed by themselves and hammered on their anvil. We may rest secure, support it within by the truth and innocency of a good conscience, having walked the ways of simplicity and integrity as before the Lord and sustained without by the powerful protection of your majesty's grace and favor which will ever give countenance to honest and Christian endeavors against bitter censures and uncharitable imputations. The Lord of heaven and earth bless your majesty with many and happy days that as his heavenly hand hath enriched your highness with many singular and extraordinary graces. So you may be the wonder of the world in this latter age for happiness and true felicity to honor of that, to the honor of the great God and the good of his church through Jesus Christ, our Lord and only Savior. Amen. That was the dedicatory of the King James Bible to the king. And then if you go on and read the translators to the readers and give you understanding, do you know that that prayer was answered? Do you realize that this King James Bible is what brought revivals to the world? None of the others. It was the old King James Bible. And you know how the Catholic Church tried to destroy it? And this is one of my favorite stories. Some of you have heard it over and over. And I'll tell you again, just act like you didn't hear it before. And uh, But when I was in England, every time I went to England, it was the first few trips was in November. And they always had these big bonfires around November 5th. And I asked them one day what it was. They said, it's Guy Fawkes Day. F-A-W-K-E-S. And I said, well, what do you do it for? He said, well, sort of like your 4th of July. Mm -hmm. That's the way the people of England look at it. So I had a complete volume set of Sir Lancelot Andrews sermons. And uh, one of them is in all Latin and the other is mixed. But uh, I was sitting, no, I was laying in bed one night reading uh, this is the day which the Lord hath made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. It was called the gunpowder treason. And I was laying there reading. And on November 5th, 1605, Sir Lancelot was saying that they are, why should we rejoice in this day and any more than any other day? He did 10 sermons on this. And he said, because the providence of God that had preserved them, amen. And I said, November 5th. And I went to the computer, looked up Guy Fawkes. I thought it was F-O-X. And it come up Guy Fawkes. And in 1605, him being a Roman Catholic Jesuit, while 
all of the translators were in Parliament, and Sir Lancelot Andrew being the bishop to the king, they were the Jesuit, Guy Fawkes, was going to blow up Parliament, and he had set all this gunpowder underneath it. And you know, without any cameras, without any warning devices or anything, by the providence of God, God revealed it before he could do anything. And what he was trying to do was wipe out these translators. Why? Because they didn't want the word of God put into the English language so the common man who handled the plow could understand the word of God for himself. Amen. And so they took him out and hung him. And every year since then, on November 5th, they supposedly are burning him in effigy. And that's what the big bonfires were about. And isn't it a shame that the English people that celebrate this every year really don't even understand what it is? Amen. This is how the devil hated this Bible. Now, we know there were some before that, but they weren't complete. He says these were purified in a furnace of earth as silver. Amen. Amen. And this was the seventh and final translation. And it perfected what came before it. Others were a couple of men trying to translate it into English, like Wycliffe and all. Amen. All right, Wycliffe. And uh, Wycliffe. Wycliffe. Amen. And uh, here there was 50-some men from different, I mean, they were from Oxford, Cambridge, different places. And yet they could all come together on 44 books uh, or 44 authors on 66 books of a Bible and not even come to fisticuffs. And the Lord said he would prefer, preserve his word. Amen. And that's why we have one more exact translation of the scriptures. And that's why we can trust it. Men have tried to foil it and everything else i know uh what was his uh oh schofield was using some uh the revised text amen that came out in the 1800s late 1800s and a lot of people getting in on this wanting to seem scholarly did the same thing clarence larkin uh dispensational truths the doctrines he taught were out of the king james bible Amen. But he would quote sometimes the RV. And where he quoted the RV, he was wrong. But the doctrines he had to get from the King James Bible. And that's one of them is that pre-Adamic earth that we talked about Thursday night briefly. Amen. Um, he did a thing on the pyramids. Uh, there was a lot of good stuff in there. He talked about Israel. And I remember this was 1916. When Clarence Larkin was alive, if you remember correctly, Israel did not become a nation till when? 48. 1948. Amen. So they had some insight through the scriptures. So we are very, very blessed to have the word of God in English. I was telling Noah the other night that I believe that the original language before... Or before the Tower of Babel was English. Amen. And I said, the reason I believe that is because every control tower in the world for pilots, they have English speaking people. They have to learn English. Why? That was a perfect language. Amen. And then you look at the butterfly alphabet up there where they found the alphabet, English alphabet and numerical system on wings of butterflies. Now, after Babel, who the heck knows what all it was? <laughs> so we ought to be very thankful that God gave us a book that we can trust wholly. Amen. And see, 
if you can pick the NIV or the RSV or any other V, amen, and you can take something out of this one and something out of this that one, and they say different things, things that are different are what? Not the same. So now you become God because you're going to say what's right and what's wrong. I'd rather stick with the time-honored one that saw great revivals and souls were saved and lives were changed. Amen. And beside that, this one here, this book right here, honors and glorifies God more than any of the others I've ever read. Some leave the deity out. Some leave the prophecy out. We were talking about the where God said that he would provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. Amen. Over in Genesis 22. What are we dealing with? We're dealing with the other Bible saying that God will provide a lamb for himself. He didn't say that. God said he would provide himself a lamb. All right. And that's why in John 1 29, John says, behold, the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, fulfilled that prophecy by Abraham. Amen. You go look at the NIV and some of these others. And then the NIV saying that uh, calling Jesus or the devil the bright morning star. And Jesus called the bright morning star. And there again, you have Jesus falling from heaven or you have the devil giving you an invitation. <laughs> and I'm told by English speaking people in England. Does it makes it easier to understand? <laughs> makes it easier to understand. I said, let me ask you this. And I opened up the book and I showed them both of them. I said, what does it say? But in the originals. I said, do you have an original? Could you get original? Could you read it if you had it? Now, if the only book I had was the one that you got in your hand. Does it say what, I, what I'm saying or not? But I said, no, does it say what I'm saying or not? Just answer the question. Simple, right here, your book. Yes! <laughs> Amen. Father, we do thank you for this morning. We thank you for the Sunday school class, Lord. Be with us in the next service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll be back in about 10 minutes.